Okay. Next, uh, next, um, Andreas will give us a uh, you know a, a report on Lester two point five fifteen and uh, beyond. And Andrea uh, Dilger is the uh, Lester CTO of WellCloud. Uh, he has been involved in development of Lester since its inception in two thousand, and through uh, several companies over the past twenty years. In twenty twelve, he took over the role of Lester principal architect, and since twenty eighteen. He's the uh, principal Lustre architect at One Cloud DDN. Thank you. I think I'm sharing. Um, so welcome to my talk. I'll be talking about um, upcoming features in Lustre. And um, so there's, you know, Peter covered a bit about the 214 um, features, what's just was released. And um, I'll be going into 215 and 216, which already have um, features that are, you know, well under development. Uh, set, several of the features um, are being landed right now to uh, to the master branch for the 215 release, and the 216 features are, um, you know, well in, underway in terms of development. And I won't be covering in detail all of the features because um, there's separate talks on several of them already. Um, Andreas, but, we're we're seeing your uh, not your presenter view, but your uh, slide view. In case that matters to you. Sorry, you're not seeing the. Um, we're seeing the not, slides, but not in the presenter view. We're seeing your uh, PowerPoint. We're seeing the view. PowerPoint. Yep. Okay. I'll make it a full screen. Um. Okay. Let's try this. Probably that same thing as last time, where you sharing the wrong screen maybe how's that still the slide view okay sorry um how's that perfect no yeah okay sorry about that all right so um yeah, I won't be going into all of the different features because there's um, there's uh, um, some dedicated presentations about um, each of them. So in terms of uh, LNET, there's actually quite a number of interesting things. Uh, as Julie had talked about, a multi-rail um, has been going on for a while. And um, one of the, the next stages in that is uh, called the uh, LNET Network Selection Policy, um, formerly UDSP. And uh, that essentially allows you to um, tune uh, network access uh, by selecting a specific interface based on the uh, peer that you're communicating with. And that allows um, uh, you know, optimizing the network route if you have multiple interfaces to select. And another um, quite interesting uh, feature that's uh, well underway, it's already uh, patch landed to, uh, to master is allowing multiple connections per peer for uh, TCP SOC L and D. And um, for very high speed uh, ethernet networks, hundred gigabyte or more, um, you end up getting um, bottlenecks with the packet processing on a single interface. And so going up to six or eight uh, TCP sockets per connection has actually uh, significantly improved the bandwidth, um, doubling it in this case. Um, and uh, for even higher speed networks, that's probably gonna continue. And so the, the cons per peer uh, module parameter is um, already landed. There's work um, that needs to still be done for auto tuning based on the interface speed, but uh, that's a relatively um, small additional uh, work. As well, there's uh, some work underway to optimize the, um, the configuration of nodes, especially with multiple interfaces and having different network types. Uh, it gets hard to uh, manage the, the NIDs on servers. And so um, being able to dynamically select uh, the right NIDs without having to, you know, shut down your file system and add interfaces and such uh, will really help on the administration side. 
And another long awaited feature that um, is seeing active development is uh, IPv6 support that's being done by Neil Brown at SUSE. And so that needs some changes to the uh, network protocol and the configuration records and things like that. So it's not a, uh, a simple change, but um, the internal plumbing for having um, a 16 uh, byte um, uh, IPv6 addressing uh, is, is already have quite a number of patches. And so those are being reviewed um, as we speak. As well, um, as clusters grow larger, uh, one of the things that's happening is uh, systems are having uh, multiple MDTs and quite a number of them. And so managing the balance of space usage across MDTs is a important um, feature for you know making DNE more usable. Originally, it, DNE was um, you know targeted at sort of administrator-based um, separation of users you know, across a large shared cluster, but uh, definitely there's, um, you know, workloads where an individual user is, you know, uh, or even an individual job may be large compared to the scale of a single MDT. So having automatic um, balancing between MDTs is really important. Um, so in 2.14, um, we're working on, um, uh, having directory split for very large directories, but we found that that isn't necessarily helping um, the normal use case where there's just you know, a large number of smaller directories. And so in 2.15, we're uh, implementing a space balanced uh, make deer um, so that as similar to how OST balancing works that you, know, you typically don't have any trouble with, with uh, imbalanced uh, OSTs under normal usage. We also want the make deer to have a threshold so that um, you know new subdirectories are created on MDTs that are um, you know less full, but only do that uh, when when there is a, a noticeable imbalance. And so uh, those patches have already landed into the master branch for uh, two fifteen. And essentially, what you can do is set a default um, directory stripe. Um, on a on a directory or directory tree that uh, says the MDT index is minus one, which means you know the MDT selects. Uh, there's a new feature, um, the max depth and max depth RR, which means that the directory inheritance. So you can set you know a round robin um, directory layout at the top level, so it's it's you know perfectly balanced across MDTs, and then below you know, one or two levels of round robin, uh, it, it will only do space balancing if the MDTs are imbalanced. So that's a way, to, you, you know, for new file systems, um, you, can, you can spread the load across MDTs right away, even if, you know, at 0% full, they're all evenly balanced, but you want to distribute your load quickly across MDTs. And so that gives you that option. Another would had come up, um, in the metadata area that you know we hadn't seen previously with you know traditional HPCs is uh, rename heavy workloads and so one of the things that we did was optimize uh, directory and file renames um, currently only renames within a single directory but that helps uh, many workloads you know rsync and things like that and because we were act adding a new hash function for uh, the directory split the crush uh, hash. Uh, we also optimized renames so that it detects common patterns uh, where a temp, you know, file name is created like dot .xxxxx for make temp um, and common file name extensions. And so if you rename those files within a crush hash directory, they stay on the same MDT and you don't get um, remote links for that. Another um, feature that started in 214 was uh, data encryption and so we worked with the um the fs crypt library from um the upstream kernel and that's you know in in use in you know a billion android handsets so it's a fairly robust um mechanism 
and we've implemented the same interfaces for Lustre so that users um, can encrypt a subdirectory um, with keys that they manage. And um, we only got the data encryption part into 214. And so 215 is handling the file name encryption. And so there are little, um, you know, some issues there uh, in terms of um, handling that properly with like a uh, link EA so you can do fit to path and things like that. And um, one of the issues that does exist with the upstream FS script is that uh, it's, it's um, difficult to do backup of, and restore of, of uh, encrypted files, you know, which on the one hand is good. You don't want people copying the data. On the other hand, it's bad. You want people to back it up and restore it. So um, we're working on that issue as well uh, so that, you know, encrypted files aren't, you know, pinned to a flash tier or something and can't um, be migrated over to another, um, another OST. And so there are also um, quite a number of improvements on the client side. I won't go into very much detail here because um, James Simmons, uh, you know, is talking about these himself. Um, but there are a number of, of new interfaces that uh, are of interest to users and applications. Uh, F allocate um, for pre allocating space, uh, seek hole and seek data. Um, you know, to efficiently find holes in uh, sparse files. So that's very useful. Um, if you do statfs on a directory where a project ID is enabled, you get the project ID uh, limits returned, which is um, also implemented in ext4 and um, XFS. So it's, um, you know, matching that, that style. Um, a new feature that just um, was implemented, automatic open lock caching, for um, clients, so things like NFS re-export is optimized, um, or applications that you know, for whatever reason, open and close the file repeatedly, um, that can reduce network traffic, and uh, large uh, ACLs up to eight thousand entries, you know, turned out to be an issue for some sites having large ACLs. And so I won't cover all of the details um, of the 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 client work, but there's lots of effort being put in by SUSE and Oak Ridge to uh, clean up the, the client for upstream submission. Um, as well on the server side, uh, we're, you know, making a lot of improvements on the, the underlying uh, storage interface for the file systems. Um, so a number of improvements in 214 to speed up um, FS check and mount. And um, you know ZFS 2.0 support went into 2.14, uh, 2.15. Um, you know has uh, some improvements on the ZFS side, and it's not directly related to Lustre, but work that we did at Intel that finally um, made it into production for the the declustered RAID. Um, and on for LDISCFS, uh, improving uh, allocation still for very large file systems. Um, there's work being done. Um, in the upstream ext4 that we're backporting uh, for LDISCFS to avoid, um, you know, performance issues when the file system is is huge and um, you know substantially full, uh, to have more efficient um, block allocation. And there's more um, in 216 as well in terms of improving uh, scalability. Um, for you know OSTs with one petabyte of space, you're going to have you know potentially hundreds of millions of objects located there, and to eff efficiently uh, allocate those, um, you know we we have some improvements in terms of the object um, directory hierarchy internally, and uh, E2FSCK. Um, I'll show you a graph um, here. So in, in 2.14, we, we actually did uh, improvements to uh, E2FSCK to run in parallel. And you can see um, the cyan bar is uh, E2FSCK pass one, and the green bar is pass five. And so those were the dominant factors uh, in a single threaded FSCK. And so you know, we improved those parts by you know, a factor of 40 and 36 respectively. But now you see what was formerly you know, this small fraction of time 
um, in past two is now actually the dominant uh, component of the FS check time. And so, um, you know, that's the next target for optimization. And this, the, the past two is directory scanning, and that's particularly important for uh, MDTs. And so that's, you know, this is a one petabyte uh, OST example, but it's still, um, you know, in this example, 70% of the remaining time. So it's a, a good target for optimization. And um, on the, the bandwidth side, um, you know, as, as was just recently discussed, the GPU um, clients, you know, are getting to be huge, right? 128 cores, you know, and hundreds of gigabytes of RAM. And so um, single client performance is very important. Um, and so we, we improved on the read ahead side uh, in 214, but there's still, um, you know, amount of work that needs to be done uh, to continue improving. MMAP is very important for AI workloads. And um, there's some work to allow um, uh, MMAP read ahead and um, also allowing MMAP hints to be passed through to the, the underlying file system. And uh, Patrick Farrell, I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute, is uh, improving the uh, direct IO and async IO performance. And, uh, you know, for a single thread, you know, he's going from 700 megabytes up to per second up to 10 gigabytes a second, which is phenomenal. And um, so, you know, that drilling down into that, the O direct is, you know, should, you know, always have been, you know, fast because you're avoiding CPU copies of the data from user space to kernel space. But, um, you know, there were some internal bottlenecks there. And uh, so, you know, with a series of, of patches, you know, peeling the proverbial onion to uh, remove the bottlenecks, um, there's really a, a significant, you know, performance improvement to be had for um, single client performance and even single thread, right? And um, so I really look forward to seeing that uh, improvement in the future. It's coming in 2.15, I think. So erasure coding, I won't cover here um, because that's already had its own presentation, but that's you know on the roadmap. Um, another interesting development that's um, you know hopefully makes it into 2.16. It's 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 ready um, in terms of the code is is there for testing, um, but hasn't seen a lot of um, you know heavy use internally yet is a cross directory stat ahead. And so Lustre has for a, a number of years already done stat ahead so that if you're doing you know, LS minus L uh, and you do read dear and then stat of every single file in the directory, um, you, know, you could accelerate the, the metadata prefetching for files in a single directory. And so what's, um, been done now is to detect, um, you know, breadth first searching or depth first searching uh, patterns, um, so that you can do cross directory uh, stat ahead. And so, if you're doing a read here and you come to a directory, you know, in this example on the right, um, you uh, hit subdirectory BB and then start reading, doing a read here on that directory. It will detect a depth first search algorithm. And so it will start doing um, a deep directory stat ahead um, instead of continuing stat ahead in the parent directory. And so that allows you to handle the case where you have a tree of directories that are um, you know, not necessarily having thousands of files in them. And the other improvement in this area is a batched RPCs so that when you're doing stat ahead and you've done the read deer, you know, you get a thousand entries back, it can send one RPC to fetch, you know, a thousand attributes and transfer them back to the client. So that um, it's similar to read deer plus, but not exactly because you don't get the attributes with the read deer. It's only um, fetching the attributes uh, of the files that it's expecting you to access. And so it can, 
not only do read deer in directory order, but also, um, you know, if your application is, you know, accessing file one, file two, file three, or whatever, it will do it in in uh, alphanumeric order, and so it, it will it will prefetch attributes in um, in bulk for higher efficiency. And um, last slide, I believe, um, metadata writeback cache is uh, targeted for landing in two sixteen. Um, so that's, you know, was actually the bulk um, prefetch that I talked about in StatAhead was a part of the write back cache operation uh, development because, you know, clients could, with write back caching, the goal is clients can do operations, you know, directly in RAM to create files and subdirectories. And uh, we need an, an efficient way to send those updates uh, to the metadata server so that, um, you know, you're not serialized by the, the the bandwidth between or the IOPS rate between the client and the MDS. And so by splitting out the batched um, stat ahead, we can, you know, get part of this work uh, landed in 215 um, and get some performance improvements. And um, that simplifies the development of the right back caching feature uh, for 216. And so this will allow you to have uh, totally local operations um, with the caveat that's in, in a new subdirectory. So for many workloads, if uh, you're, you know, on tarring, you know, you have a directory per client or per thread, um, it can create a, a directory, you know, write, you know, thousands of files in there and then, you know, shoot those off in a batch to, um, to the metadata server. And so that's actually shown um, significant improvements in our testing and uh, you know it needs you know real hardening and review and things like that but it's um it's doing quite well all right i think um that's it for the presentations i will stop here and see if there's questions thank you very much andres for this comprehensive report on the uh, next version of cluster and beyond that and uh, we are running behind schedule, so let's uh, take one question here. Um, okay, here's a question. Due to the NVMe devices, metadata metering is the most required feature. So any plans on this? Um, we don't have any um, development underway for metadata mirroring yet. Uh, there was a, you know, a design that we've talked about and, um, you know, some, some proposals on how we would achieve metadata mirroring. And it's it would essentially be a, a, an extension of the DNE, um, you know, uh, distributed transactions that we already use for things like rename that involve multiple metadata servers. Um, but uh, currently we don't have any development underway in that area. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andrew, Andrew, uh, if you can stay in the chat room for a while and address any more questions people may have, that would be much appreciated. Yeah.